I don't remember my family ever talking about race when I was growing up. We drove right through the middle of the Detroit race riots one hot July night in our Plymouth station wagon, 1967. Four kids and two adults packed into the heart car with the windows rolled up tight. I sat squished in the dark back seat, petrified, as we watched army tanks heading downtown as we headed to our safe, distant, all-white suburb, as flames leapt in the near distance. Yet I don't remember any conversation about why the buildings were in flames and why army tanks were rolling down the expressway. How could that be? I'm going to talk about what it takes to learn to talk about racism. This is not about doing it for the benefit of people of color. It's about the benefit to those of us who are white and how that, in fact, will benefit people of color. In fact, it'll benefit all of us. There's the racism out in the world out there that needs to be challenged, the unequal opportunities and resources. Um, <clears throat> I'm sorry. The unequal opportunities and treatment of people and communities based on their race. And then there's the racism inside of us that gets in the way of us seeing and understanding and acting on the racism out there. It's that racism inside of me that I'm going to be talking about. I was curious as a child about people who were different, because as soon as I was old enough, I started to venture out of my all-white suburb and into black communities. By the time I moved to Boston at 20, I was intent on living in a racially diverse community. Looking back, maybe this was because I knew there were other worlds out there and nobody was telling me anything about them, and I was curious. Curious, not judgmental about difference, which is how most children start out, where skin color isn't any more of a big deal than eye color or hair color, until someone or something teaches us otherwise. I don't remember being taught anything about race when I was young. It wasn't until my 30s, after a decade of living and working in racially diverse communities and raising two white sons who went through the Boston public schools, where they were a minority, I started to see the inequities in my son's schools. See, the white kids, who made up maybe 15% of the school population, were assigned to the favored teachers every year. And it was the black boys who always seemed to be held in from recess by the lunch monitors. And my son would come home and say, but so-and-so didn't do anything, they just held back all the kids. In this case, all the kids being black boys. The white kids were disproportionately selected for chorus in student newspaper. And if you've spent any time in schools, you've probably seen these disparities. You see, it wasn't just about the kids of color getting the short end of the stick. It was about the white kids getting preference. And I knew enough to know this wasn't right. I got involved in the school parent council, and I started to raise these concerns, but first, just very quietly inside my head where nobody would notice, because I still didn't, I didn't know how to talk about racism. What if I said something really ignorant? I was sure the sky would fall in on me. My first big aha moment was at a school site council meeting where the principal passed around standardized test results. So we get the test scores, English and math, for the kids broken down by race. This was before No Child Left Behind before educators and parents were really paying attention to test scores. So I look at these scores, and the median scores of the white and Asian students were literally twice the median scores of the black and Latino students. These were eight, nine, ten-year-olds. They were kids I knew, and there's no way you could tell me those black and Latino kids were half as smart as the white and Asian kids. But nobody said anything, and I was unsure how to raise this. It kind of felt like the emperor's new clothes, you know, where it's like, I can't be the only one who sees this. Why isn't anybody saying anything? So I finally, I couldn't stand it anymore, and I said, how can this be? So the principal was patient and clear about explaining the many factors that go into these disparities. And it opened up a conversation that needed to happen. This was my introduction to naming racial disparities. It scared me, but what I saw happening to those kids scared me even more. And the sky didn't fall in. In fact, the more I raised issues of race, the more I learned how racism worked. The formula sounds simple, but nobody had taught it to me. 
that first encounter with test scores was 25 years ago. My kids are grown up now, and there's now a much greater understanding that a racial achievement gap exists. Many of us prefer to call it an opportunity gap, which puts the emphasis on the conditions out there that created the problem, the unequal opportunities and resources and treatment that caused children of color to be disproportionately failed by our schools and across society. Once I figured out I could name these things, I went to trainings on racism, and I helped bring these trainings to Boston. One of the African-American trainers would ask me, so why do you do this work? And for years, he would ask me this, I'd have my answer. You see, I'm Jewish, and my parents both came of age during the Nazi Holocaust. My mother always used to say to us kids, the Jews were as integrated into German society in the 1930s as anywhere in our 5,000-year history, and look what happened. So the lesson was don't get too comfortable, because wherever there's injustice, we're, je we're next in line. I have no idea if this is true or not, but it's the story I was raised with. And that was my answer for about a decade for why I felt compelled to take on racism. Then over time, this shifted. I began to peel back the layers in my own thinking and feeling. I learned about implicit bias, how we all have unconscious biases, whether we're willing to admit it or not. It doesn't make us bad people, it means we're human, because we've all absorbed the racist stereotypes that are out there, persisting in the media, embedded in our history and our institutions. And they profoundly affect how we interact with each other. I'd like to say I never looked back once I started to notice these things, but that's not true. I left a job where I, I was the head of a small nonprofit where we decided to take on racism. And what happened was that it surfaced conflicts that I didn't know how to handle. We'd have staff meetings, and my African-American coworkers would patiently explain to me how I was being overly controlling. And I would say, I'm not going to get defensive, even out loud, okay, I'm not going to get defensive and then I would feel the defensiveness creeping in, in spite of my best intentions. You see, I so wanted to get it right when it comes to issues of race, and I so wanted to get it right with people of color. I spent a lot of time in my bed that year, huddled under the blankets, confused and upset. I'm still learning how to admit my, to my own shortcomings, still learning how we become more connected to each other's humanity when we're willing to admit that, admit that we're not always going to get things right. But back then, I just wanted to get it right. Eventually, I picked myself up and realized that there was a lot more at stake than my own comfort. And I found that I started, I started to feel a lot healthier, more whole, more balanced. I realized how much psychic energy had been tied up in fighting all this racist muck in my mind that was keeping me from seeing things, from seeing myself and from seeing other people clearly. It took a lot of reflection and a lot of feeling like I don't know what the hell I'm doing, I'm going to blow it again, and I still just want to get it right. And my commitment shifted over time from needing to get it right to, un to an openness to learning and seeing how race really was impacting things in ways that I never had before. As a result, that paranoia and defensiveness started to slip away when a person of color said something critical or something I was unsure how to interpret. I could see how the racism that was buried in my thought processes had colored my reactions to people of color around me, and it kept me from really building real relationships and learning for myself. And I found that when I said out loud to people of color, I understand, I have this racism in me and it gets in the way, they weren't offended. The reaction was more like, yeah, we know that, it's only you white people who don't. <laughs> the next big leap was holding up the mirror, seeing how those of us who are white benefit from racism. It's like the wind at my back when I go for a run on the beach. I, when I go for a run on the beach and the wind is at my back, you don't even notice it. I'm just like, wow, I'm really running fast today. But then I get to the end of the beach and turn around, and bam, that wind smacks me in the face, it pushes me back, and it slows me down. And I never would have noticed if I hadn't turned around. So that invisible wind at our back is what it feels like to be white in America. Things just go easier for us, and we don't have to ever even notice it. 
So often we white people think of racism as a problem of people of color. It's not anything I did wrong. I'm a good white person. I treat people fairly. I have friends of color. Let's be honest, how many of us think these things? Then I started to notice some cracks in this theory that being a good white person was enough. I've come to understand that we all have a responsibility, even if this thing called racism wasn't of our own making. I've come to understand that getting it right every time is not what it's about either. It's about sticking with it, not running back to our comfort zone when issues of race come up. We all need to be willing to name racist actions when we see them, preferably out loud. We've seen Ferguson, and we've seen the and we've seen how the policies and practices inflicted on that community is what caused it to blow up. Black Lives Matter has raised the visibility and increased the number of people in this country who understand there's still a problem in all of our communities. And the sooner we recognize that we all will be better off for addressing it, the better we'll all be. Equally important, we need to be willing to look inside and understand what racism does to us in here, to hold it up, to name it, to examine it, and to address it. My life has become richer by doing this, by asking some hard questions. Who's in my day-to-day -day life? Does it reflect the diversity of the people in the world in which I live and work and move through every day? Back when it didn't, I had to ask myself, what's getting in the way? Ask yourself these questions, then go forth with that child's curiosity. Pay attention to those reactions where we freeze up. We don't know what to say. We're unsure what to do. Allow yourself to make mistakes because we don't get past these things without practice. And I guarantee if you stick with it, you will get better at, act, react, at interacting more honestly with people who are different from ourselves and at interacting more honestly with yourself. And when we get to this point, we can better take on the racism out there with strength and clarity and courage and the sky will not fall in.